the final session today. Um, and I, I do so, first of all, by thanking Matteo and uh, Mary and the team for putting together the Carbon Hub in the first place. And um, we feel very privileged in Cambridge that we're a part of it. And uh, so thank you also for the invitation to come here. Um, I think I meant to say something about myself. Um, basically, I've had three, or could argue even four careers. One in metals, then moving to polymers, polymer physics, starting with the most flexible molecule of polyethylene, and then over a two, couple of decades, gradually getting interested in stiffer and stiffer molecules. And then the step to carbon nanotubes was simply seeing a single wall carbon nanotube as the ultimate rigid polymer molecule. And that led to a, a lot of fun. I'm now well retired in theoretical terms, um, um, but I've got now a, a new uh, area of responsibility um, in terms of climate change and what Cambridge should be doing about it. Um, it's very, very privileged to introduce the panel. It's a slightly different sort of panel because we have the two Carbon Hub people here, and we have three um, gentlemen from, I, I just say, industry at this stage. Um, Matteo really needs perhaps no introduction. Um, and then Mori, likewise. Um, thank you for everything you've done uh, regarding getting this meeting going. Um, and then we have um, Joe Powell who, from Shell, who is actually um, really um, AJ who we've already heard from in disguise, but thank you <laughs> for having you. And, and then uh, Luca De Rey um, from um, Prisimian, um, and thank you sir, for coming. And then finally David Dankworth, who is a distinguished um, scientific advisor to ExxonMobil. So having said that, welcome. Um, I think we're ready to start the individual talks. Um, that's got a rather engaging title of the Carbon Hub and Corporate um, Sustainability. I think we're all ears to hear more of the Carbon Hub and how, in fact, uh, various uh, entities can become a part of it, and we look forward very much to that. Um, but as to what is exactly meant by corporate sustainability, perhaps that will become clearer during the talks and then the general question session that will follow. So I think it's my great pleasure to ask Matteo um, to take over the podium and give the first presentation. And if the other guests would rather sit in the audience and then come up when your turn is, that will be fine. I will be sitting in the audience, but I'm likely to be waving my hands um, if I sense we're running a bit short of time. Thank you. Alan, uh, thanks a lot for uh, the introduction, uh, and uh, thanks for coming. It really means a lot. Uh, Alan, as uh, um, Leonardo Spano said earlier on, is uh, one of the people who really um, changed how we looked at nanotubes, uh, uh, and not as a dispersed uh, material, but as a, a fully structured material, and it means a lot that it took... Uh, time out of his uh, so-called retirement <laughs> to come here. Um, and um, so, uh, the, what Avers has said and contextualizes and some of it will say why we're doing what we're doing. So this is a summary of a flux of uh, what we call fossil carbons. Um, Every year we got out of the ground about uh, five and a half uh, billion tons of uh, carbon and 1.2 billion tons of hydrogen. It's a very big disparity in mass, but very interesting. The energy is almost 50-50, uh, as uh, Adam and others uh, pointed out. Cheating a little bit because is there, there is a delta H of formation for the few chemical engineers and chemists uh, uh, who actually uh, notice. Now, uh, most of that gets uh, emitted. It's interesting, what we emit is much more oxygen than carbon, but uh, uh, is, uh, it is the problem now that's causing uh, climate change. Um, renewables are growing. We heard uh, from uh, Scott in the morning, 
Uh, one thing that is depressing when I started looking at this uh, slide going backwards, that mix hasn't changed in a long time. Uh, and uh, uh, Scott and Ajay showed us that it will change in the future, and we really hope it will change in the future. But even with the, what they call these pretty aggressive predictions, it doesn't get us all the way to where we need to go. So um, embarking this required a little bit of a change of the way I thought. You know, I grew up thinking hydrocarbons were scarce, and probably most of you did the same because, you know, I'm probably right about in the middle of the age group here, maybe on the high side now. Um, and, uh, and so uh, now this is not true anymore. Is, uh, we're looking increasingly at a situation where we have excess hydrocarbons uh, compared to um, the, um, what we can uh, use them for if we stick to which is peak oil production. We're talking about, uh, Scott and uh, uh, Jay said today, we're talking about peak oil use if we don't find other ways to use it other than burning, oil and gas, let's say. And we know that peak coal is already behind us. So uh, we have some things that can be deployed, and uh, um, some people are more aggressive than ever saying how ready they are or how much they will take us from. This is CCUS, solar, et cetera. You know, today we talked a little bit about uh, what does it mean to build a new hydrogen plant at scale. And, uh, but clearly, whether we're more aggressive or less aggressive in, uh, in putting our faith in the solutions that are essentially shovel ready, uh, there is a consensus that uh, those take us 20, 25 years ahead, further. We need something else because that's not going to take us all the way there. I mean, Ken brought up the fact that now we're looking at 10 billion people. It's so another thing that, I, that is interesting. I've been looking at population predictions since 2000 when I moved to RISE, and every population prediction I've seen says that population will stabilize at some number. The number used to be 8 billion, then it went to 9 billion, then 10 billion. So this thing that population will stabilize, I mean, eventually will stabilize, because like Gary said, there's only so much carbon in the earth, but it doesn't look like it's stabilizing yet. So we need new solutions. Um, it, you know, I, now that I have to do these things, I try to be creative when I speak. Is uh, As I started looking at this, I felt I was playing whack-a-mole. I would think, oh, this is a good solution for climate change. And you find out that you, that solution will brings up another problem, makes another problem hard. Right? So, for example, um, well, how do I go backwards? Um, so hydrogen is great, but then you say, where do I get hydrogen? I cannot mine hydrogen on Earth. Uh, you know, <laughs> Brian has a proposal going to the sun, so then you gotta find it somewhere else, and if you get it from water, which is the nicest way in terms of cleanliness, then you need energy because uh, you need all the energy you're gonna get out plus a little bit more. Um, decarbonization of industrial sector, and it is where everybody throws their hands up in the air, steel and uh, Cements are the uh, primary offenders. Other metals are actually even worse than steel, just they're smaller. Now, if you t start talking about light weighting, uh, you want to make cars lighter. Well, it turns out that you take a, a material that has relatively low footprint, like steel, and you substitute the materials a higher footprint, like aluminum and carbon fibers. Um, and they are energy intensive. If you want to electrify, you end up with weight increase because electrical motors are in, in all the transmission of electricity are more are heavier, you're going to need batteries, and then you need more copper and aluminum, which again are materials that have high energy intensity. Um, with the predicted peak of oil and gas, and I think that was the same as, uh, graph that Scott showed, um, there is a real possibility that a lot of our resources will end up stranded. By the best of what I could calculate or estimate, is about 8% of the world economy. This is just from locating the oil to uh, getting it out to refineries and distributing it. That doesn't have all the induced uh, uh, wealth. So this could be a massive uh, um, change in how in our economy. So can can we do something else? Now, what, again, as I started looking at this, I was surprised that nobody was talking about this because, for example, I had heard about uh, water energy nexus. Uh, long time ago, even though I don't want to don't work in water. So I said, how big is this? It took like tops, you need five exajoules of energy to get all the water we need every year. 
We use 12% of the world energy just to make the three primary metals, steel, aluminum, and copper. Okay. So, uh, and then if you look at the CO2 emissions, because those are mined as oxides and you need to reduce them, and uh, carbon is really the only uh, reducing element we can use, we could theoretically use hydrogen, but remember, there's no hydrogen mines, so if we get the hydrogen from SMR, we're back to square one. And, and again, nobody talks about this. So um, I actually think these guys are getting away that they, can, they must have some spectacular ways to control public opinion. Bill Gates is now he's starting to, to, to tweet uh, and blog about this. So is there a way to, to leverage this? Um, now, of course, uh, you know, you start looking at the splitting of hydrocarbons, and there's a lot of literature. Uh, there's a patent from Shell from 1940. There's stuff that's older. Uh, and I, I'm cheating a little bit. That is actually to make ethylene and, and, and other chemicals. But still, this idea of making carbon from natural gas is old. In fact, it was used during World War I. The reason we, don't, we went out of business uh, is because uh, flare gas became cheaper as a source for carbon black. But carbon black was made out of natural gas uh, here in this area around World War I. And so can we have a new value chain for the carbon and also get the hydrogen for energy? And again, this is something that was discussed mostly by uh, Leonardo um, Spano, is uh, there is uh, this damnation of scale, uh, and uh, uh, if you try to meet your hydrogen demand uh, uh, with uh, carbon, you end up with at least three times more carbon if you use methane, or higher if you use either hydrocarbons. And the markets for carbon are very limited. Uh, we're talking about uh, 10 plus million tons per year. Unless you are making other grades of carbon that will be combusted, but that's where the carbon hub draws, draws the line. So we're not going to look at uh, playing uh, these games where you shuffle cards. We're actually going to look at uh, situations where the carbon displaces emission not, is not combusted. Um, now, of course, uh, there is a possibility of, uh, uh, as Leonardo said, uh, um, you could bury it, uh, and, uh, and even that is not that simple. But if you bury it, you only uh, get one benefit. So if you think about this uh, uh, in uh, the idea of these uh, wedge games that uh, Sokolov uh, and uh, Bacala uh, uh, you know, published in 2004, is this, how many slices I can take out of the CO2 problem, um, if you make useless carbon, you have a very narrow operating range because you have no other users. So it's going to be economically viable in very limited conditions. If your carbon is displacing other emissions, for example, it's displacing materials that are CO2 intensive or is lightweight in vehicles, then you start displacing more and more emissions, you start creating more value, so also your basic wedge uh, grows. Um, and this can be applied as an idea to other ways, for example, uh, fertilizer, industrial sectors, etc. So where can you put uh, the carbon? This slide is actually out of Cambridge. It's uh, uh, Mike Asher's book, Materials and the Environment, where he compiles all the materials that we use and oil and gas, I put them up on top uh, for comparison. You see really that uh, if you exclude polymers, where, which is the only use of carbon, fossil carbon, where we uh, use um, uh, as materials, you end up really with only two areas where you want to be. You don't want to be displacing wood, right? So you could displace ceramics or you could displace uh, uh, metals. The opportunity with metals is that the values are much higher. Metals start at about uh, 80 cents a kilogram and go up, and as you go down that curve, they go up and up. Um, whereas uh, structural materials and ceramics are much lower value, as Jenny uh, showed us. You're talking about uh, cents per kilo to tens of cents per kilo. So uh, also, a lot of metals are used in transportation. There's 100 million tons a year of steel that go into cars, and so uh, that's where lightweighting can also be attractive. So structural integrity is key for widespread use. And uh, um, so can we envision something like this? We start with hydrocarbons, we split them, we have to pay some energy, and Adam talked about this already, but it's only a small amount, in theory, in principle, it's a small amount of the hydrogen energy. And so if that carbon is in a shape that we can be uh, made into um, um, fibers, tapes, and other structural materials, there is actually a process by which you could uh, go all the way here. And this is not theoretical. This is 
something real. So what what is different now from other times where we, this was uh, uh, tried is now because of nanotechnology, primarily carbon nanotubes, it is possible to make materials the other route that have structural integrity. And there's uh, they're over here uh, on the table if you'd like to take a look. And so uh, there's various routes, and uh, Adam uh, and uh, Leonardo covered a couple of them. They all end up with properties that are in the same ballpark of, of uh, metals. And so what happens in that case is if you're in the same ballpark, you mean you can do displacement as long as you're cost effective. And so you could think about uh, an introduction curve like this where you start small, because right now the production is very small, you go after some high value applications initially, and you don't displace uh, um, any emissions, but then you start uh, uh, getting big enough that you avoid the emissions coming from other materials that you're displacing, like carbon fibers, like aluminum, and then at some point you get big enough uh, to finally have a very meaningful or dominant hydrogen production. That's when you are in the hundreds of million tons per year. Now, but we cannot do this because of cost right now. Now, Marie actually found this book and gave it to me to read last year when I was trying to think, what is it that we need to do? This is what happened to solar. So solar started off, um, and it was crazily expensive. Uh, it was used by Dell Labs to power uh, satellites, military use. And then finally, when the US and the Western Europe realized that they had an energy problem, Solar started getting into the mix. Very interesting, in Nixon's speech on energy independence, which is the one that talked about independence, he never talks about solar. So they were really an underdog, but still they start. And then uh, Carter starts a solar energy lab, which is now NREL. And then you see this thing keeps going down and now, and now solar is cost competitive. And they did a 10,000 times cost reduction between 1955 and 2015. You see the alternating spots? Those are governments losing interest. And that was a lot of boom and bust cycles. And the other thing is, you see it's cost competitive, it's only about 0.1% of primary energy because they didn't develop the whole supply chain, okay? So now, if you look at where we are, we probably only are about two orders of magnitude away uh, uh, because two orders of magnitude of cost reduction were already achieved in the first 20 years of this century. But we also have to put attention to deployment. What is the opportunity for deployment? Finally, there is some pressure on the industrial sector to reduce emissions. So those are the emissions uh, of CO2. Um, and uh, the right side is when you take electricity and heat and you apply to the uh, end use. And what you see is industry is actually the biggest emitter. Um, and finally, what we see, and we'll hear it later on, for example, from Luca de Rai, but we saw it in press releases by clothes manufacturers, by the, lots of uh, consumer product manufacturers. Um, consumer product companies want to reduce their emissions, and they're the ones who drive the whole supply chain. So everybody has to reduce their emissions, which means that finally these industrial emissions need to be um, um, reduced, which means now there is a way to go to the users and say, get off your laziness of uh, just wanting drop-in solutions, which is what uh, Adam and Gianni and Leonardo were paying, was talking about before, and come a step towards our way and see if you can use these materials, change your designs, and uh, help us introduce faster. So uh, that's uh, where the goal is. We go from uh, where we are now, which is a few thousand dollars a kilogram for carbon nanotube fibers, or materials to something that's a few dollars a kilogram. Now the opportunity is in the ballpark of a trillion dollar, which is not that crazy because that's about the steel mark, okay? And, uh, uh, and we're still an order of magnitude over the cost of the raw materials. So uh, last year we had a workshop where we were thinking about starting the Carbon Hub and we said, okay, what are the barriers? And there's really two big barriers. One is uh, the um, Manufacturing efficiency, and uh, Adam talked about this a lot. The other one is user adoption. And so can we set up a structure that propels us through this? Um, and it's really three components. We have to do R&D at the manufacturing level and the product level. We need to develop a supply chain, and you have to look at uh, policy to incentivize and assess this. But then you can generalize it. For example, Leonardo was talking about soils, talking about concrete additives. You probably have some other ideas. Now here, these are situations where you make your money out of hydrogen, not out of carbon. 
but you can actually put them through the same uh, set of tests. Um, it identify rapidly triage potential solution. Um, carbon, can you get it from direct splitting of hydrocarbons? Can you determine what large scale uses you will have? Can you evaluate uh, scale and cost? And if you can show uh, this, uh, uh, that something in this area can work, then we can go forward, look at the barriers, and do it again. If there's uncertainty on this, we can go and deploy projects to gain more knowledge so that we can answer those questions and then either go through workshop and director development or go through other ways. So what are the barriers to this? Well, one barrier is little public awareness. I and mean, there's, there's lots and lots of press on climate change solutions and nobody talks about the direct splitting of hydrocarbons uh, with concurrent production of materials. And in fact, uh, somehow, most people are still saying, well, decarbonizing the industrial sector is impossible. So those are the last emissions that will ever go out. There's actually confusion. <laughs> we talk about uh, decarbonization. We cannot decarbonize. 50% of our body mass is carbon. And Carrie told us about all the wonderful things about carbon. None of the languages that I know of has a word for carbon dioxide. Everybody uses a chemical word. It's very interesting. German, French, Spanish, Chinese, Japanese, they all use the chemical word. We have uh, words for ammonia, <laughs> methane. We don't have one for carbon dioxide. Um, so fossil fuels are still as a proxy for hydrocarbons, even though they're different. We need portfolio approaches. Uh, we need short-term solutions. We need uh, longer-term solutions. We need to assess them. How do we do this all together? Um, we don't have a community. There's people working on old-style carbon, people working on nano-carbon. They don't even talk to each other. The hydrogen community is disjointed for this. Um, there's uncurated efforts on properties, uh, and uh, um, there's uh, um, a lot of skepticism in the user community that these materials can actually deliver. We also need persistent efforts. Um, there's, uh, people talk about energy time. Energy time is decadal. Uh, um, decisions are made by energy executives have to have the staying powers of many decades. Uh, that staying power is an, almost in no other institution. And so uh, markets specifically are into boom-bust cycles, gold rushes. Academia has become the same, right? And so this is the hype cycle that Leonardo had for carbon nanotubes that shows uh, how uh, the academic community started the hype and then industry and uh, the investment community fed the hype and then uh, after 10 years uh, we realized that uh, this was not delivering and what did we do? Shift to graphene, okay. So uh, how do we keep the community and government attention over long time skills? And that's the idea of uh, an institute. You need an institute uh, and you need this as a nonprofit uh, to do this. So the good thing is we started. Um, carbon is not a problem, CO2 emissions are the problem, and hydrocarbons can be part of a solution. We're working with the Baker Institute, you heard from Kim Matlock and Mike Meyer, how do these new ideas uh, play in the whole portfolio of solutions that could be deployed now or later? Uh, how can we get more rapid feedback as some of these ideas become uh, more proven on how, what are the policy uh, barriers or uh, facilitations. Um, we need to create a community. Um, competition doesn't work when the leading producer makes 10 tons a year and the second one makes a ton a year. Okay, we need to take this to a totally different level and this is not the moment to compete, it's the moment to co collaborate and maybe contend, right? And then there will be a moment to compete or many moments to compete because some of these uh, products eventually and processes need to go out and become competitive. ARPA has been a fearless partner. Uh, as Mark von Kite said, we started talking about this over three years ago. ARPA did a program. Uh, because of some difficulties having to do with the fact that government uh, has cycles, they couldn't make a big announcement when the program was released, and that lost a little bit uh, of uh, the um, impact. But Mark has done a fantastic job of uh, um, creating this community. And so nonprofit organizations, if you think about it, they're the longest lived organization that we have. You know, the Catholic Church, universities, Cambridge, Bologna, uh, they have survived a millennia or more. Uh, and, uh, and so here we need to do this in a nonprofit, measure progress, create knowledge, and manage expectations. 
We have a lot of uh, universities that have uh, expressed desire to join. We have companies whose logos are not here because they have not signed agreements, and so I don't know how to um, um, use their logos, but uh, um, definitely they would like to participate. Now, Ajay gave me uh, an idea to use this. This is my favorite thing, Pasteur's Quadrant. And I was thinking about this a lot in 2013, when a lot of stuff was coming out of my lab that would look like a great idea, we ought to start a company, this is really innovative, and nothing was happening. And then one of my students moved to Boston to join a startup, and he calls me up after six months and said, Matteo, if your lab were in Boston, you would start in, you'd be starting one to two companies every year. And what I understood at that time is innovation, Intention, you can do it alone. Leonardo, actually, uh, Da Vinci, uh, did a lot of his invention alone. You cannot innovate alone. It's, uh, it's teamwork. That's why it works so well in the Silicon Valley, why it works so well in the Boston area. Innovation is a team sport. And, uh, and, and it's really a perpendicular axis. So it's, uh, this Leonardo octant is uh, this axis where you take applications and fundamentals and you push them into innovation, but you cannot do them alone. And so uh, you need to work in teams to create the future because uh, if you are creating the future, you can make prediction. That's why there's laws against insider trading, right? And uh, unfortunately, Mark Goulthorpe cannot be here. He is also is a, is a very inspiring member of uh, the methane cohort that Mark von Kites has set up. And he's actually designing houses, and he does have a funded project to build houses, and he's bringing us all together. He's already integrating materials that are going to come from Huntsman, materials that are going to come from us, and maybe, you know, in the next year, they're going to, he's going to get to meet Alan and Adam, and maybe some people from Cambridge can end up in the carbon house as well. And so this is the mission we have, um, to make uh, hydrogen and carbon materials concurrently to help... Uh, uh, foster the prosperity and the standards of living of the entire world. And uh, will you join us? Good afternoon. So um, I will trust the system. Okay. So this morning I started the day asking a few questions. I asked, can we find technological solutions that will allow us to meet the energy demand? without CO2 emissions? Can we decarbonize the industrial sector? Can we lightweight and electrify the transportation systems? So, may the force be with you up there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> awesome. So I hope that so far all the panel discussions you've had are convincing you that yes, there is a feasible pathway. And it is now that it can happen and that it needs to happen. And the impact of these pathways are phenomenal on sustainability. So you direct split hydrocarbons into hydrogen, so you have a clean source of energy, and then you have a form of solid carbon. It can be unstructured, and like Carrie Maciello explained, you could use it as soil additive, you can improve water drainage, soil quality, agriculture. Obviously, lots of questions remain, but it can be done. And for structured carbon, like Matteo and Adam mentioned, you can get... Um, Microscopic materials, like here, you can see there are fibers, and uh, I mean, I really encourage you to come and touch them, because you wouldn't believe that this is all made out of carbon. This, this is what it is. And so all these materials have properties that overlap with metals, which means that you can really displace metals, which are huge offenders in terms of energy and have very large CO2 footprint. So that means that the impact can be massive and is really well aligned with several of the sustainability development goals of the United Nations, which is exactly what Mike Mayer was talking about this morning. So obviously you need a very solid science basis to determine these highly efficient pathways to go from hydrocarbons to hydrogen and valuable forms of carbon. But it's not enough to solve the science problems because you need to have new value chains, new supply chains, new manufacturing chains. You need to put in place material grades. You need to develop a new workforce. You need to put in place health and safety standards. So the scope of what needs to be done goes beyond what a single university or a single corporation could be doing. And it really requires enlisting and coordinating the efforts of many actors across industry, academia, and the government. 
And this is where we have the carbon hub. The carbon hub is to enable these pathways, is to be the focal point that will nucleate the discourse, the R&D, and the policy making across industries and disciplines. So the carbon hub is bringing, this is a cool toy, um, all the suppliers, all the, the supply chain together from the energy companies that get the hydrocarbons out of the ground. And then you have to go from hydrocarbons into the hydrogen and the solid form of carbon. What do you do with that carbon? Put it in usable shapes, then put it in applications. Um, does it meet the needs of the end user? So you really have to bring everybody together around the table. We're also building a very solid academic ecosystem with several universities across the world, and we have a lot of representatives today. And obviously, we're also tapping into the expertise of the national labs. So right now, the Carbon Hub expertise, the Carbon Hub uh, research team includes, I think, 70 researchers over 20 different universities, research institutes, and national labs. But how are we going to make this happen? Well, the success of the Karma Hub depends on the tight integration and successful articulation of four quadrants of activities. So the, the piazza, which you have up here, oops, it's about community building. So it's about bringing together, informing, coordinating the scientific and engineering community that's in, that is interested in working on these problems. Then we have the scuola, which is about uh, the workforce development. So that will be done through technical articles, webinars, or courses. And finally, the two main pillars, the foro and the bottega. So the foro is exactly what Ken was talking about. This is where the Baker Institute will take the lead. It, it, it is about um, assessing the impact on, from the point of view of society, from economic point of views, of adopting, deploying all these new materials. It's about engaging with environmental groups, regu regulatory groups, and community leaders at all levels to ensure that the technology development, the policy making, society needs, and society perceptions all will remain in sync. And finally, the last quadrant is the Bottega, where the scientific questions will be answered with the scientific ecosystem that we're creating. So the question you may have is, okay, I'm not a corporation, I'm a single person, how can I participate? Well, this is really a fantastic ecosystem. There is room for everybody. So when it comes to corporations, obviously, um, what we're going to do is set up a carbon hub that is only funded externally. So currently, RICE is supporting the establishment of the carbon hub, but we need external funds. We need corporations to come and be interested in sponsoring the research projects. We need corporations to share their needs so that we, re we maintain our relevance. And obviously, corporations will be having their internal R&D efforts. So if they can share some of those results, things will move a lot faster. Academia, obviously, we want to bring all this expertise together. So we're looking for the research expertise. We already have a lot of faculty coming together. Um, we want the scientific community to be built. So the faculty has to come together and build this community, because like Mathieu said, it's very fragmented. Even within the carbon community, they don't talk to each other. The carbon hydrogen communities don't talk to each other. So we do need to create all of that. Um, and obviously also, the role of academia is to inform and elevate the discourse to make sure that we can take away the barriers, such as regulations or policies that will really uh, not allow to adopt and deploy innovative solutions at large scale. Then when it comes to the federal labs, well, they're a key component of the Carbon Hub because they're already working on a lot of efforts that are very well aligned with what we want to try to do. So if they can keep working on those efforts, align them, then it can be extremely powerful. So NIST establishes standards, NREL, like we heard, is working on hydrogen renewables, <coughs> And NETL has an effort, obviously, on fossil fuels. Oak Ridge, a lot of expertise in carbon materials for certain applications. And DOD is always an early adopter of new technologies. And finally, the community, in a, in a broad term. So, like Matteo said, the Carbon Hub is this institute in a nonprofit. So, the core of the Carbon Hub is to really serve the interests, the needs, the priorities of the community. 
So we're here to really answer those problems. We want to create this expertise where people can come and understand, okay, what is real, what is not real, what's happening with technology, what are policies, what should happen, what shouldn't happen. But obviously we're also starting small, so I've portrayed four quadrants, so you may ask, well, I didn't see anything about philanthropy, I didn't see anything about the investment community, and I didn't see anything about startups. You're correct. We had to start somewhere. But we do realize that there will be a lot of commercial opportunities coming out of these research projects. So we, there will be opportunities to work very closely with the startups. So the bottom line for the community is, please come talk to us, give us suggestions how we can make this structure even more impactful. And like Matteo said, please come join us. We need everybody to solve these problems. Thank you.